on behalf of MIRA, which is the Mining Insurance and Risk Association, I'm delighted to welcome you today to listen to Dr. Franco presenting his thoughts on the quantification um, uh, of tailings dam risks. Uh, Franco is a long-standing member of MIRA, um, as well as uh, heading up uh, RiskScope, uh, an international practice on risk and crisis management, um, as well as being a coach and author of a number of papers and co-author co -author of various books. Um, whenever we have a presentation on tailings dams um, at MIRA, it naturally generates a huge amount of interest, um, and this is certainly no uh, different. It's great to see so many people from around the world joining many different countries uh, around the world, many different backgrounds. We have people from the insurance industry, from the mining industry. Um, we've got geotechnical engineers, risk engineers. Um, so we've got a, a hallowed audience today. Um, as always with a global reach, um, it's impossible to find a time um, for these types of online sessions that are gonna suit everybody. Um, so apologies now for anyone uh, who finds themselves watching this um, at a very unsociable hour. Um, and as I said earlier uh, on the call, if we've got anyone dialing in from the east of uh, east coast of Australia, then certainly applaud your commitment to the cause. Um, but you, know, you, you haven't uh, joined this to hear me uh, prattle on. So without further ado, I'll pass the podium over to Dr. Franco. Um, I've no doubt that you'll find uh, his talk and discussion extremely interesting. Um, but Franco, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, James, for this uh, introduction. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is the summary of over 20 years of applied research and development. Um, and so I will show you an example from real life dam portfolios. Uh, so it's real life experience that is brought to you today in these uh, 20 or so slides. Um, of course, to retain anonymity and foster confidentiality, we have removed all clients' information. Um, I note that the objective of our clients range from immediately regulatory compliance to better understanding of risks prioritization and management of inventory portfolio. Now, what we will show you here is a methodology that we apply when we deal with larger portfolios. So it is not a detailed analysis of a single dam, but it's very useful to evaluate a portfolio and make decisions out of that portfolio mitigative decisions, investment decisions, capex decisions, and so forth. What we are going to see, we are going to see that there is no reason to justify, no scientific reason to justify why tailings dams should be rated by consequences only or, or, or probabilities only. Indeed, highest consequence in portfolio do not always correspond to highest risks. And the same happens with probabilities. Furthermore, looking at consequences, sorry? Hello? Oh, there was an interference, I guess. So, Furthermore, uh, looking at consequences and probabilities gives us an idea of risks, but unless we compare those risks to corporate and societal risk tolerance and risk acceptability criteria, then we have trouble defining sustainable and mitigative roadmaps. An insurer would have trouble uh, justifying decisions uh, deciding which dams they want to assure or not, and so forth. Furthermore, if we don't consider all the above, the risk assessment may lead to very uh, misleading conclusions, and this will end up squandering capital and generating unwanted overexposures. So, 
there is a body of literature that talks about corporate and societal risk tolerance. There is a body of literature that talks about probabilistic analysis of slopes and dams. And sometimes we find it really odd that actually <clears throat> within the field of tailings dams, this body of literature is not taken or given due consideration. So it is true that <laughs> applications that may derive from space or from, from other areas might be too complicated. And, or to tailings, our procedure, because it's more a procedure than, than a methodology actually, uh, it makes it accessible to mining companies to get to the bone of probabilistic risk analysis in a sustainable and specific way. Here is the flowchart of the ore to tailings application. We have to start somewhere. So let's suppose that you have a portfolio with 10, 1500 dams. You certainly have inspections, archival data, models, um, forward and backward space observation, monitoring results and so forth. This is all material that a mining company general ha generally has in their data room, in their repository, and so forth. So we're certainly not going to waste any of that information. But of that information, we are going to distill KPIs, key performance indicator. This key performance indicator cover any type of dam, whether it is center line, upstream, downstream, and they look at all the different uh, dam life phases from inception, that's a major characteristic of the O2 tailings methodology is that we look at the whole history of the dam. Out of those KPIs, we will distill the risk analysis. So the probability of collapse and the consequences. We will then compare this risk, these, these risks with corporate tolerance and societal tolerance to risk and, and with the prioritization and a proposition for relative related mitigative roadmap. At that point, the client is able to make better decisions. And at that point, we also restart the loop because as you know, nothing is uh, stuck in time. Our environment is very dynamic, especially in these times of um, climate change. So let's start by looking at different uh, parts of the risk equation, consequences. We have roughly 100 years of history of failures. It is an imperfect history because data were not gathered in a uniform way and so forth. Nevertheless, we can see very quickly that there is absolutely no correlation between most of the parameters that one would look at. If we focalize now our attention on deaths or fatalities due to dam accidents, and we compare them, for example, to storage volume or to run out distance or to release, we see that actually the clouds of points are completely uncorrelated and there is absolutely no clear conclusion to be drawn. So rush statements that we have heard in conference and even read in papers, such as bigger dams represent bigger risks, are very easy to disprove with facts. I remind you that one of the most dramatic and significant accidents in the history of tailings dams was the Stava Dam in Italy. And the Stava Dam was a very small dam. Nevertheless, it killed over 800 people. So the other major point that uh, we will make and I will show you how important this is, is that the discriminant between healthy dams and failed dams is certainly not the factor of safety. Indeed, if you look back, almost all dams, including the failed ones, 
had very similar factor of safety. That immediately indicates that factor of safety is not a good proxy variable to safety, actually. And factor of safety should not be used to address risks. Now, many clients and colleagues understand this. And we remind now that factor of safety doesn't include geotechnical uncertainties. What we do as engineers most of the time is to look at the experimental data, test data, and select values that we consider prudent. And then we apply these to stability analysis and other analysis necessary to design a dam, and we are happy with it. But we also know that the factor of safety doesn't include human factors. It doesn't include if, for example, out of uh, lack of effort, we do too short borrows to start with. It doesn't include if we understand the geology properly. It doesn't include if the dam is properly managed, maintained, monitored in the future and along its life. And finally, precisely because all dams have similar FOS and we, we notice that some fail and some don't, it doesn't really allow benchmarking with worldwide performance. So the conclusion of this is the factor of safety lacks of finesse, doesn't look at the multitude of KPIs that can cause failure. Cause is a very important term here and doesn't include the long-term history of the structure since their investigations to date. Remember that many dams fail because they have congenital defects. Congenital defects means from conception, before birth. If a dam is born with too short borals, or if a dam is born with misunderstandings on the geology, those defects will sleep there from day one until the dam unfortunately collapses. We have numerous cases that have been shown to follow this unfortunate pattern. Now let's talk about failure modes. Now I know that uh, some of you will want to burn me <laughs> after I say this, <laughs> but this is something that is for me extremely important. Failure modes explain how a failure occurs, not why it occurs. Allow me to make a medical analogy here. Failure mode is that I might have a heart attack right now. So I die because my heart stops. That's a failure mode. I am dead. How am I dead? Because my heart stopped beating. But the reason for that, so the cause for that, has to be seeked somewhere else. Do I do enough exercise? Have I ever done exercise? Have I uh, been careful with my dietary life all my life? Have I done this? Have I done that? Do I smoke? Do I don't smoke? Those are the causes of my final and very unfortunate failure mode. So failure modes are not the answer to making good risk assessment. Ask your doctor and you will see that he will not tell you you have to pet your heart every morning. He will say you have to pet your body every day for your life and then you might have a better chance of good quality survival. So failure modes are where designers can act to reduce further hazard, future hazard. But actually, if you look at the risk assessment, they are unfortunately a censoring tool. Why are they a censoring tool? Well, all the recent uh, and not so recent forensic analysis on dam failure have shown that dams fail because of a conjunction of modes and the conjunction of causes, not a single one. 
So risk assessment that look separately at different failure modes are bound to be censoring reality. Now, this is what we do. We look at over 30 key performance indicators to define the probability of failure under various conditions. These are the bubbles on the left of this diagram. As you can see, we start with investigations and, and geological models here. We look at ancillary water management, tailings line, traffic, project construction, erosion controls, liquefaction, piping, seepage, as is status. In other words, how well is the dam maintained and taken care of, monitoring and inspection. All these KPIs are then uh, summarized and, and, and put together in four families that we call investigation, design, construction, operations, and maintenance. As the dam evolves, the causality of its potential failure evolved too. At, in or to tailings, we look at the causality analysis of the dam. And we also, we look, of course, at what the probability of failure might be. That's the main result of our analysis. And once we have the probability of failure, we combine it with the potential consequences and we get an image of risk. Notice here that we give a lot of importance to all the ancillary uh, water management structures. And that can be diversion ditches, can be diversion dams upstream of the dam, of course, penstock, uh, spillways, and so forth. So basically, we have a causality factor that grows throughout throughout the life of the of the dam we have uncertainties that evolve throughout the life of the dam at at the moment of the analysis we have a certain image of the probability of failure of the dam actually all the results of the analysis of a single dam are summarized in this sheet this is a real dam uh, as you can see here, is 72 meters high, is an earth field dam. It's a inactive dam. It could be active, it would be calculated differently, but it would be there. And there are some general remarks here. And then case by case, these are the, uh, the different cases that the engineers of these dams analyzed during their design and further stability analysis. For each one of those cases, we evaluate the probability of a failure of the dam itself and the probability of failure of the dam with the ancillary water management facilities as they are and the probability of failure of that dam if the ancillary facilities were quoted perfect or they were functioning exactly as they have been designed by the engineers. As you know very well, uh, when we do inspections, we may find spillways that are actually vegetated or concrete broken, cracked and so forth. And those are all points that come in detraction of the safety of the ancillary facilities, uh, including, of course, initial under design, and those are uh, reflected in higher probabilities of failure. Now, uh, I know that a lot of people are always asking if, if this applies to upstream dams. Of course, we can analyze upstream dams with this methodology. We have done it in several countries. And as far as is upstream dam way more hazardous than another dam, my answer is it depends. 
It depends because I know of upstream dams that are extremely well built, designed, built, managed, and monitored. And therefore, I am not, uh, uh, I, I don't think that uh, a priori bans in some region are uh, a preferred way of acting. I would say that any upstream dam anywhere in the world has to be evaluated per se. So what happens with those probabilities of failure? We combine them, uh, as I said earlier, it's like different diseases or different organ failures that may lead to uh, an unfortunate conclusion. We combine them and we obtain this, where is my cursor? We obtain this image here, which is a bar you will see in a moment this can be way longer than what we show here. This bar is, defines the range of the annual probability of failure of the dam. And we benchmark this probability with respect to 100 years of history of tailing stamps over the world. Imprecise history, but it's better to have some kind of imprecise history than having no history whatsoever. And this benchmarking goes like this. We have selected two decades, one around 1999, one around 179, uh, 1979, that define a range of probabilities of failures that were typical of those two decades. Incidentally, around 1999, it was a decade where there were very few failures, and 79 was a decade where there were many, many major failures. And so this delivers, the orange bar delivers what is the performance of the worldwide portfolio based on history. If you are in the blue area below, it means that your dam is in a better situation today than the historic benchmark. If you are above that orange bar, namely in the gray area, it shows that your dam is worse than a world portfolio, historic. And out of experience, because we have done a number of analyses on dams that uh, had failed or were in a very, very poor shape, out of experience, we have established that from 10 minus one up, we are in a pre-catastrophic level of, of probability. And so if you have a dam that pushes up there, then you better do something right now and, and uh, try to contain possible problems. Now, the little blue dot that you see here and you see there is what happens to this dam if the water management facilities were in a perfect state. Now, here is the image of the full of a full portfolio. As you can see, there are a number of dams, uh, 16 namely in this case. You have the same graph as before with the same benchmarking values. And you can see that some of these dams are in pretty good shape like these, but they have huge uncertainties. Huge uncertainties because sometimes the data room uh, reports or the, the, the extant documents that we can grab are not enough to fully grasp what we think the history of this structure has been. It could be that the water management facilities are in poor state, but they could be repaired. And so we show explicitly the uncertainties that exist for this dam and we show the client where it could imagine to reach if the water management facilities were perfect. Incidentally, if we get down to 10 minus five to 10 minus six, you are not only bordering credibility, so the credibility threshold of human endeavors and human um, analytic capabilities, 
but you're also in the domain of well-designed major water dams, which, as you know, have a rate of failure which is at least an order of magnitude or two lower than tailings dams today. Now you have also dams that are bordering the top, so the, the poorest, the highest uh, level of probability of the worldwide benchmark. And you have in this case, some dams that are in a pre-catastrophic or could reach the pre-catastrophic uh, situation. Those are certainly dams that trigger our attention in terms of probability of collapse. But remember, this is only half of the equation in the risk. We need to look at the consequences. So consequences, they have dim dimensions and they have a metric. Oh. Contrary to what is normally done in, in uh, FMEAs and, and things like that, where it is told to the analyst to select the worst uh, quality of, or the worst dimension of consequences to qualify uh, the results, we claim, and I am sure we are right, <laughs> that consequences of a dam failure are additive. So it is not pick the worst between business interruption, health and safety, physical losses, environmental, and so forth, but is add all the consequence because of business interruption, health and safety, physical losses, and so forth. And take into account crisis and reputation, including legal costs, fines, and liabilities. So when I show this, people say, oh, well, uh, that's impossible. We have even heard and read people making papers on imponderable consequences, which I think based on our experience is not really a way to go. I don't like obscurantism in, in science and in engineering. So we have developed a model. What we have done is to look at the last 10 years, but we could do this with, with the last, with more if we wanted. Uh, last 10 years, major recorded accidents in the world. And we have applied our model, which adds the consequences, estimated those consequences using, um, using the willingness to pay for human life, using factual uh, cost of damages and so forth. And then we have calibrated what we have found um, based on a few accidents, I must say a few, where um, the factual consequences are known. And this you can see here is our result of the model for different, the different accidents that have occurred in the last 10 years. And we apply this simplified model to evaluate consequences at portfolio stage. So we don't, at portfolio, of course, we don't have the means, our client don't want to go into detailed dam break analysis and so forth. They want to have a quick and dirty evaluation of the re comparative risks among, across their portfolio. Final chapter of this analysis is defining the tolerance and the acceptance threshold. And this has become a science per se. We actually can give courses on this because it's where engineering and psychology um, merge. There are the orange curve, this one, the, the curvilinear image that you see here, here is actually the corporate curve. Uh, each client, each project, each operation has a different tolerance. And then the, you have here the benchmarks, the four lines of the benchmarks. And the diagonal 
lines, which are actually, because we are in log-log, these are actually hyperbolic functions, are standard uh, threshold that you can find in codes like ANCODE and other codes um, defining, for example, ALARP as low as reasonable, reasonably practical. Note that these curves are generally parallel to what we call the ISO risk. ISO risk is a line that says that you accept any consequence for any probability provided probability times consequence are constant. So it would be, it would be the, the tolerance that a computer, uh, a simplistic computer would accept uh, for a risk assessment. And what you can see here is that we have defined over time uh, seven areas that correspond to seven behaviors or seven attitudes that corporations may apply. To make a very simple example, up here, number four, you have very low consequence, very high probability or rate, rate of occurrence. And if you are in that condition, generally people accept it. As you can see, it is above the orange curve. But after a while, they get annoyed by the aggravation of having this constant repeat of these small accidents and they will fix it anyway. But a priori, it is, it is a tolerable accident. Then you have this five here, area five here, which is above ISO risk and below tolerance. This is typically an area where people feel more comfortable than they should, and they accept stuff that can then come back and bite. And obviously, whatever is outside, so seven and six are areas where the risks are intolerable, both socially and corporately. So let's look at how this applies uh, in real life. First of all, no a priori judgment. We are very adamant of this. As I said earlier, upstream design are not necessarily more hazardous than downstream or center line designs. Consequences depend more on the environment than the dam type. Failures of downstream center line dams are not necessarily less significant than those of upstream dams. Small dams are not necessarily less risky than bigger dams and so forth. So we refuse systematically to perform any a priori judgment. You have seen this diagram already once, I repeat it because this is actually the uh, risk assessment that we're going now to show all the way to the end. We need to define the multidimensional additive consequences using our model. Here they are expressed in million dollars. And as you can see by the numbers, this is a portfolio of relatively small dams. And I did, we did this on purpose is to show that this methodology can be applied to portfolio with smaller dams. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't need to be reserved for monster dams. And again, because nobody has said or nobody is able to justify a priori selection saying that the bigger dams have bigger risks, I strongly recommend to always have a look to the entire portfolio. It has happened to me in Northern Canada to perform a risk assessment on a, on a 20 dams portfolio and come out with a conclusion that I would have never fathomed before doing this, that it was actually a causeway that was, uh, that was the, uh, represented the highest risk in that portfolio. It was a big surprise to me uh, the clients were speechless. They started by saying that I was crazy. 
And then once we went through the whole process of explaining why, they started scratching their head and they realized that actually it was something they had completely forgotten in their overall view of their sites. So, same portfolio, 16 dams. Here they are placed on, a, on the diagram with a, with a tolerance. And you can see each dot represent the centroid or the maximum, it depends what we do and how we do it. It represents the risk of a dam because it has, it has a probability of occurrence, annual probability, and it has a cost consequences. So probability times consequences is the risk. And big surprise, all of these are slightly, well, are above the, the benchmarking, taken aside these two. And all of these are actually tolerable from a corporate point of view. And two of them are intolerable from a corporate point of view. Now, these intolerable ones could be tactical or strategic. The difference between tactical and strategic is if I can inject money in these dams, in dam A3 or dam A14, and with the money injection, mitigative money injection, I can move this point to get below the tolerance, then I have a tactical risk. If no matter how much money I inject, I can never push it underneath the tolerance, then I have, I'm facing a strategic risk. And the strategic risk requires changing the system. So it may require things as uh, drastic as removing population from downstream or building uh, a, a, another a dam downstream or something that will completely alter the system. It's not just reinforcing or uh, repairing the dam. Now, as you can see here, all of these dams are above the benchmark. So they are more prone to failure than the historic portfolio, worldwide portfolio, but in this particular case, they are below corporate tolerance. And also, they do not cause harm to people. And therefore, what you see here is consequences that are made of dimensions that do not include harm to people because there is no people that can be harmed in that area. Here you have the proof that Qualifying dams based on consequence may be wrong. Not always, but um, in our experience, it happens very often. If you look at dam A16, which is not only tolerable, but it is also at the benchmark with the worldwide, at the limit of the benchmark with worldwide performance, you can see that A16 is uh, is actually tolerable, but it has a larger consequence than A3 and A14, which are, which are intolerable. So we are in a situation where uh, if we had based our rating of the risks of the dams in terms of consequences, we would say to the client to throw money at dam A16 to mitigate it, whereas the most painful ones are A3 and A14. I would consider this a mistake from our part, and I would certainly not go that way. So when a client says to me, look only at consequences, I always try to convince them to change a point of view. Note, and you will see this in a second, that not only, a, oops, <laughs> a second went too fast. <laughs> oops, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So from current slides and page up, page up. So 
you will see in a second <laughs> that not only A16 is uh, at benchmark and tolerable, but it doesn't even show in the top five risks. So really in this particular case, it would be a major mistake to consider A16 top ranking because of its consequences. And here we go with the, let's say, final image of this portfolio. You see that as far as intolerable risks, DAM A14 and A3 together represent 100%. And actually DAM A3 represents 71% of the intolerable risks. So it's really the one where we would like to to uh, act first. Prioritizing is very important, especially if you're managing a lot of dams or if you are insuring a lot of dams. And the second graph, pie graph here down, down shows the top five risks in terms of total risks. So the tolerable and intolerable part. And here you can see, of course, that A3 and A14 represent the largest share of the top five risks. And if you do, if you look, A3 is 46%, A14 is 30%, 46 plus 30 is 76%. And you see something that we always uh, reach as a conclusion when we apply all to tailings to portfolios is that the Pareto rule, so the famous 80-20 rule, is basically always verified. In other words, you take a very complex and, and complicated international portfolio of tailings dams of different makes, different years, different level of care, and the Pareto rule comes out true probably around 20% of them, uh, sorry, about 20% of them represent 80% of the risks. So or to tailings allows to focus the attention on uh, the dams that are really the riskier and the most intolerable ones, and therefore allows to focus any mitigative, mitigation roadmap in the most effective way. So closing remarks. Well, I hope you agree with me that selecting operable KPIs is paramount and these KPIs have to cover the whole history of dams, of the dams. Um, the probabilistic approach that we put together have to look at the dam system and not just the dam. And when I talk about dam system, I mean also not only the design and the, and the assumptions that were made at its uh, inception, but also the management, the monitoring, and how it is taken care of. We need to avoid failure mode driven reality censoring and that's very, very important. We have to remember that failure modes are a design tool. They are not a risk assessment tool. And there is ample body of evidence that shows this, uh, especially if you read very carefully all the latest forensic analysis and all their appendices, which takes a while, as Tony Eldridge said, very well at uh, TMW 2019 in Vancouver. He said, read the appendices and it's long, but do it. And he's absolutely right saying that. And finally, to reach ethical, sustainable portfolio mitigation, we have to avoid, absolutely avoid, unproven shortcuts. So looking only at probabilities or looking only at consequences or just doing uh, compliance type of, of uh, actions. So at the end, this procedure helps mining company to formulate sensible roadmaps for mitigations. And we think a better future for all, especially when large portfolio are present, 
because we can focus the attention on the risks that can really hurt. Wow, 40 minutes, I guess, and uh, 30 years of work. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Franco. That was uh, really interesting um, and, and certainly goes beyond um, the types of presentations that, that certainly within the insurance industry uh, we've been used to, which um, have been a, a lot more simplistic, uh, describing the difference between upstream and, and downstream uh, tailings construction methods. So um, I think it's absolutely fascinating. Um, and we've had very, very few people drop off the call. So either you send them all to sleep um, or that, that actually been riveted uh, to the presentation. So, uh, congratulations. Um, we've we, we have naturally we've got uh, a good number of questions that have come through. We've got about 15 minutes um, before the end of the scheduled session. So, um, with your leave, I'll go through some of these in in no particular order. Um, we won't get time to go through them all, um, uh, and maybe we can take some of them, some of them um, away, and you can we can answer them. Um, uh, afterwards and post the answers back up online. Um, but let me go through uh, some of these. Um, throughout the presentation, you've discussed the probability of failure and you've quantified those probabilities. Um, but the question is, how have those probabilities been derived? Yes. Um, okay. We don't, don't give away all your secrets. No, 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 no. Uh, we are actually writing a paper precisely on that that will be published at TMW 2020. But let me give you the gist of it. So um, in, a, in a classic way, I was doing this 30 plus years ago already. We can evaluate probabilities from a geomechanical point of view. So we can use any model, mm. uh, st stability model or whatever. Uh, introduce the variability of the parameters and derive a probability of failure by looking at the factor of safety and seeing whatever uh, the probability of failure is of the probability of the factor of safety being less than one, okay? So it can be done that way, but there is a big but. Um, a lot of researchers, including a wonderful paper by uh, Chris, Christian and Bescher in 2011 have shown that doing that severely overestimates the probability of failure when compared to actual performance of real structures. So in auto tailings, we use semi-empirical, a mix actually of semi-empirical methods that link the factor of safety that the engineers uh, developed in, a, in their classic study to the probability of failure, plus analysis bearing on the reliability of the, of the ancillary water management facilities. So it's a, it's a whole mix of ingredients that are used to get to the probability of failure. Okay. Thank you. Um, we, we did have a couple of questions about um, the factor of safety, um, acknowledging that it's not a panacea and it, it certainly doesn't tell us everything. Um, just if the, uh, the dam capacity is increased, perhaps years after the initial construction, does that um, automatically mean that the factor of safety is reduced? Sorry, once again, I must give you a, a, a Swiss answer. It depends. <laughs> it depends. There is, no, there is no fixed rule. It depends, first of all, define the end of construction because uh, a dam, a tailings dam is generally growing as we speak. So I would say the only thing we know is that there is a variation of its probability of failure and factor of safety throughout the life. That's the only, the only honest way I have to answer that question. Okay. And I think um, we've, we've perhaps been guilty in the insurance industry of an over-reliance on using factor of safety 
safety as an indicator of the health of a, a dam, albeit we've, we've been getting better at, at um, addressing some of the other issues. But in terms of looking at a suite of KPIs um, or indeed KRIs, um, what should we be looking at? Or again, is it not such a simple answer? <laughs> we use, as I said, we use over 30 and it depends how you count because we have KPIs and sub KPIs that basically summarize the results of our understanding of and, and, and knowledge of the extant data on the dam. So the, the ensemble of all the reports that have been written on the dam and observations that are made on the field, either by us or by uh, whomever is inspecting the dam and the monitoring results. So those KPIs basically are the equivalent of what you get when you go and do a medical ch uh, checkup. Um, the doctor will tell you your blood pressure is okay, your retrocardiogram is okay, this is okay, this is okay. Ah, your cholesterol is a little bit high. And that's exactly what we do for a dam. We cover the whole history of the dam from day one to the moment of the analysis, as far as we have the documents. And if we don't have the documents, then we do two things. Uh, or if we have very poor documents, we advise our clients to do backward satellite observation analysis. That's something that people are uh, not too familiar with, but it's extremely valuable. Satellites have been going around for quite a while. So there are the historic database that allow to be analyzed. So we propose a backward analysis and then a forward analysis. And we compare this to detect movements, to detect stress in the vegetation. There is a number of parameters that can be derived from space observation today, which are absolutely fantastic. And by saying this, I'm not saying that we don't want to see a dam. It's very important to go on site, but there are stuff that can be seen from space that we would have trouble seeing with any other instrument, like very uh, diffused deformations, perhaps a few centimeters over 100 meters, uh, uh, that we have seen on, on, on the crown of dams that would not be perceptible. And certainly out of pure fluke, there is never an inclinometer where you want it by definition. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and you talked about, um, I, I guess, the, the arsenal of information that you have available in your, your risk assessments, the documentation, the, the potential use of satellite uh, technology, um, but also the on-site investigations. Um, what's, the, what's the kind of the weighting um, of that site investigation um, in your assessment? How, how important is it? Listen, you can build a dream dam that has, and pun intended, clayly feet. If you don't know that they are clayly, you're done, right? So the, the initial investigation and the understanding of the geology is absolutely fundamental to the analysis. But I would like to stress again one, one element. If you ask me, is investigation more important than uh, later maintenance and so forth? I will say, I don't know. We need to see the case. Okay, no prejudgment ever. When, when somebody tells me this dam will fail because of liquefaction, I said, oh, I'm glad you have that intuition, but I want to do the analysis because before saying that, I want to understand it. And getting to that point, I want to make one other thing very clear. Uh, our practice differs from most of engineering companies around the world because we always say before going to site, we want to read. I don't go to a site if I've not read everything I can read and gobbled down it and understood everything I can on that site. When I go to the site, I want to know the site already. Then 
I can look at stuff that is important for me. If not, I think I'm wasting my time. Oh, I'm making some money, <laughs> but it's not the way I like to make money on the, uh, wasting my clients' money, okay? <laughs> preparation is key. Pardon me? I guess preparation is key to preparation, everything. Preparation, absolutely. Preparation is key, absolutely. And, and uh, going back to what you were saying about um, you know, the, the geotechnical uh, issues and, and uh, the question we had was that the fact that geotechnical recognition is crucial, um, but many mining companies have significant gaps in their knowledge for, for whatever reason. It, it may be because through acquisition, historical records have, have been lost, but nonetheless, um, the use of geophysics and drilling uh, can start to fill in some of those gaps, but we don't see mining companies uh, doing that very often. And why, do you know why that might be? Well, <coughs> it might be that um, the way they look at the dam is different than the one we, we have. So they don't realize that the less they know, the riskier they are. And even a benign dam might actually conceal large overexposures that are completely misunderstood. So in many cases, and we are working now on two different projects where uh, in two completely different continents where, where we are saying to our clients, look, this is the preliminary vision we have on the risk. And as you can see, you have these two or three dams that are, seem to be very risky but they seem to be very risky because we don't know enough. So if you invest some money doing some more investigations, we might be able to reduce that bar to, to narrow the gap and the risk landscape of your portfolio as a result can completely change. Or in some cases, we have, we have even a case now uh, where a client has uh, stability analysis that were done 20 years ago, the last time. And since then, a lot of alterations have occurred on the dams and they don't know what their factor of safety, the simple engineering factor of safety is anymore. So you look at one image here, that shows a dam that was built 20 years ago with a certain factor of safety. You look at the next cross section, which is the 2019 cross section, different beast. And we say, hey, you know, this cannot be real. <laughs> this, this doesn't work. And so we suggest them at least since likely in that particular case, there is no big change due to consolidation or, or you know, chemistry or something else that could really alter the parameters of the, of the soils involved, we suggest them at least to grab their engineers and redo the analysis, the stability analysis. Okay, thank you. Um, we're almost out of time. Uh, I'm sure we could uh, keep talking for another hour about this. Um, just one last uh, question from the audience, if I may, before the end. Um, do you foresee in the future an increase or decrease in both the probability of failure of tailing stands globally and an increase or decrease in the consequences of those failures. Okay, okay. Um, we were four billions humans um, 20 years ago. We are seven billion and a half. Pretty soon we are nine or 10. The and the environmental awareness is increasing. So one way or another, consequences for if, if a dam is located in an area where all of a sudden there is demographic pressure and there is built up and alteration of land use, consequences will certainly increase. No matter how big or small the dam is, consequence will increase. On the other side, um, probability, new dams, and we just had a case two months ago, we did an uh, ore to tailings analysis on a, on a big, massive new dam in Latin America. And I can tell you that the level of care 
the level of analysis, investigations, and so forth for that dam is such that its probability of failure is in the order of bordering down to credibility. So it's, it's better or as good as a major hydraulic hydro dam. Okay? So that dam has that probability today. I trust that that company and that operator will maintain it top level with the proper monitoring and so forth. So I don't see that dam to go higher or lower more than normal tolerance, uh, normal uncertainty, let's say. But if you have a dam that is neglected, uh, that nobody is monitoring very assiduously anymore, and if that dam undergoes extreme events that perhaps provoke some damage and the damage is not repaired, then the probability of failure will spiral up. And we have written a paper at TMW, I don't remember which year, where we showed exactly how that spiral works. And if you take that plus climate change or plus who knows what other phenomenon will occur, Take COVID. With COVID, people are not perhaps inspecting their dams that well anymore. Perhaps there are uh, patrolling of the pipelines that don't occur that much anymore. All those elements come in, in, in uh, go towards increasing the probability of failure of an accident. So consequence will increase. Probabilities not necessarily depends. Great. Thank you. And we, we have run out of time. Um, my personal thanks, Franco, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of the entire audience. Um, a thoroughly interesting and, and really useful talk and presentation. Um, just a note to everybody in the audience, a copy of uh, this recording will be made available uh, on the MIRA website um, that will be sent through um, in the next few days. So uh, you can revisit this as much as you like. Um, but for now, uh, thank you for joining. And again, Franco, thank you indeed. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. which should be at the bottom of your screen um, and certainly there will be time at the end of the presentation uh, to go through any questions that come through um, but otherwise um